145,000 members in the UAW, and you were oblivious that a strike might happen? How can any shareholder hear the CEO say that and go, oh, that's my guy? You are a bad CEO. Literally, all the white so-called online leftist commentators in NA are libs at best. You can tell how they're PRing for Biden at the moment. To be fair, I mean, I'm call me a libtard too because I'm fucking doing PR for the Biden for the Brandon administration as well. Not for Brandon specifically, but the NLRB. I want to hug and kiss them. They are doing great work so far. Okay, Brandon himself personally, and I will tell you this much, is absolutely, absolutely motivated, guided in the, and, and has the ear of the wrong people. Why do I know this? Well, where, where is the, the fucking beautiful boy, Eddie Germentum or whatever? How do you fucking spell his name? He actually showed a Brandon quote that I think is really interesting because that Brandon co corresponds to in the, in the UAW strike that is currently occurring. Brandon had a really interesting quote. Hold on. <sighs> Fuck man. This guy, Fucking post non-stop. Jesus, Lord, mercy. Where is it? 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 This was a good one, too. He's moderating for the general election. I'm trying to find his post where he talks about the, the Joe Biden being oblivious and, and up until the strike happened, literally thinking that the strike wasn't going to happen. That in and of itself wasn't him downplaying the strike, for the record. That was not him downplaying the strike, okay? That was him actually thinking that the strike is not going to happen because... I, I think even the fucking CEOs did not think the strike was going to happen. And my 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 assessment for this or or my take on this is motivated by what I've heard the CEOs say. Like they were caught off guard with their fucking pants down. They literally thought that it wasn't going to happen. How can you be that oblivious? Okay, I can't find this goddamn fucking post. This guy posts like nonstop. It's from like over the weekend, I think. And it just like stuck with me. Oh, this is the one. This is the one. Oh, thank God. Okay, it was a David Dayton post. Are you out of your fucking minds? Democratic Representative Debbie Dingell told a longtime advisor to Joe Biden after the president publicly predicted the UAW wouldn't strike, according to a person familiar with the talk. Here is, here is the article from Politico. But at times, some Democrats and labor leaders said the two sides have not been operating from the same page. As an example, they noted that earlier this month, Biden publicly had predicted there wouldn't be a strike. I'm not worried about a strike, Biden said, ahead of his speech in Philadelphia celebrating Labor Day. I don't think it's going to happen. Fain, Representative Debbie Dingell from Michigan, and others were marching in a Labor Day parade in Detroit when they learned of Biden's comment. Dingell would later tell Fain that she called longtime Biden advisor Steve Ricchetti and screamed at him over the comment, according to a person familiar with the talk, and granted anonymity to discuss details. Are you out of your fucking minds, Dingle said, per the person. So how? How do you get here? Because the Democratic Party at its fucking core is corrupted, okay? Every single person with an earshot of Joe Brandon is the exact type of fucking dumbass that these CEOs are. How are you this oblivious to the labor momentum in this country? How are you this oblivious to the understandable needs and demands that your workforce is making that is the hilarity here to me this signals that brandon at the very least is playing catch up here which is good because he did come out and show support for the uaw who cares he's been great on labor man shut the fuck up i'm the one who says that not you suck my dick okay that doesn't mean he's not worthy of criticism and that certainly this this quote in and of itself certainly signals Who's in his ear, idiot? I'm doing political commentary, not just going, oh, Brandon is the greatest president of all time. Suck my dick. It's good that Brandon is playing catch up and at the very least is not like inherently antagonistic towards labor movements. That to me signals that there is at least a change, a sea change, an attitude change, okay? In the Democratic Party and even in the Republican Party, as a matter of fact, I'll say that much, okay? But let's be fucking real. While the NLRB is doing great things simultaneously under the watchful, uh, you know, eye of the Brandon administration, this to me signals that there is literally a major, a major disconnect with the CEOs and the rank and file and the people that are literally on the assembly lines, and there's a major disconnect 
with Brandon and the working class. Are there no Democratic representatives, consultants out there that work in this field, in this space, that could have uh, told him that, no, this is a very real strike that's about to happen? Of course there are. The problem is they're not in his orbit. Do you understand what I'm saying? They're not in his orbit at all. That's the problem. Biden wasn't alone. Adeyemo predicted no strike on CNBC a week later. It seemed to be a White House position, and when I asked multiple people, nobody could explain it. Okay? I work at Ford, and even the day before, Ford didn't think it was going to happen. Yeah, exactly. And for the record, for the record, they literally did not think that this was going to happen to a degree that where, like, the bosses, the CEOs currently, are so, like, they're, they're so callous, so careless, so inconsiderate that they have the audacity to go on national television and say, oh, I had no idea this was going to happen. 150,000 fucking workers, dog. 145,000 rank and file members in the UAW. And you were oblivious that a fucking strike might happen? How can any, any shareholder look at that, hear the CEO say that and go, oh, that's my guy. I want him to keep being the CEO. That is an abdication of duty. You are a bad CEO. That doesn't even make sense from a fucking CEO perspective. Like, that doesn't make sense from a pro-capitalist perspective. If you're that oblivious to the fucking demands that your labor... Like your, your, your productive labor force has, then you shouldn't be the fucking CEO. It blows my mind that they can openly say it, okay? They can openly just... They can openly just put that out there. Where is the guy? Where is the, uh, the, the Ford CEO who said this? I, I'm trying to find the video right now. Oh, this is it. This is it. This is it. There's no way we can be sustainable as an economy, says Ford CEO Jim Farley, if they paid what the UAW is demanding. In this interview, he literally was like, yeah, we didn't know it was going to happen. It's just so unreasonable. The offer that they have, what they're demanding relative to where, we, where you are right now, how much damage would that do to the bottom line if you were to say, sure, we'll give you 40 percent? If we signed up for the UAW's request, instead of making money and distributing $75,000 in profit sharing in the last 10 years, we would have lost $15 billion and gone bankrupt by now. Uh, bullshit. Fucking bullshit. The average pay would be nearly $300,000 fully fringed for... F we covered this before, and then he immediately turns the fucking attention away to... So like, what about the teachers? It's like, bitch, what do you mean? Was them not knowing good or bad for the UAW? No, of course it's bad. Uh, it, it's bad for the UAW because, like, they didn't think that this threat was real. So when you, when you think that the threat is not real, you don't meet the demands at all in good faith, so much so that they had to file grievances with the NLRB. The UAW had to do that to get them back to the fucking bargaining table. Here it is. Biden not worried about the UAW strike versus Detroit 3. Don't think it's going to happen. I'm sorry. You cannot be a fucking CEO of a multi-billion dollar corporation, act like you have a fiduciary responsibility to your fucking shareholders, and be like, yeah, this is crazy to me, actually. Uh, I think it's completely uh, ridiculous that this happened. I don't really understand where this came from. It's like... How are you that oblivious to the reasonable demands that your fucking workforce is making? And why do you think that you should still be the CEO? Uh, to this UAW strike with our next guest, Harry Wilson, chairman and CEO of Mava Group. He's previously the senior member of President Obama's task force. Harry, it's good to see you this morning. You, you make some, uh, some points we want to talk about here. Welcome. Good. Uh, how are you? Great, Jeff. Been, Great to be been a while. Uh, we keep hearing, we heard Sean Fain the other day, Minimize the uh, the effect of, uh, of of what actually labor costs are in relation to pee. I'll be back. an automaker's overall uh, income statement or whatever you want to look at with seven, eight, nine percent. I forget what it was. You point out that that is very misleading because of of the, the, the way things work. It's such a low margin business that a a raise like this. Free cash flow could be decimated, so the company could never basically have a hard time innovating or investing. 
Yeah, I, I look, I think the most important thing that comes out of this process, however it gets resolved, is to make sure the companies have a, a sustainable framework for long-term success, which is what we created back in 2009. And that involves a number of things, but part of it is the ability to invest in research, innovation, and growth and development. That's good for the companies, it's good for the, for the workers. And what happened in the past that led to the failures of General Motors and Chrysler in 2009 was because they had uncompetitive deals, not just on labor, but across the board, made bad product decisions, and as a result, didn't make that investment, it ultimately failed because they weren't able to compete long-term. And so to me, the real focus needs to be on that same shared sacrifice, shared success that we established in 2009 that held for more than a decade. And because of the record inflation we just went through, increases in auto prices and profits and the, the old collective bargaining agreement, that was violated in the last few years. And that now we're playing catch up. So creating a deal that allows for addressing that with significant wage increases, significant ratification bonuses, but keeping that in a sustainable framework to still allow for long-term success through investment, that's the balance that needs to be struck by both sides. Yeah, I sounded... I mean, look, the UAW helped save the economy by taking a fucking pay cut and uh, changing the COLA adjustments, cost of living adjustments, that they previously had bargained for when the bailouts were happening, okay? But what did the fucking CEOs do? They never, in good faith, gave the cost of living adjustments back, okay? They also set up a two-tier structure, which they are trying to currently uh, eviscerate, where the same workers on the fucking assembly line are getting paid less for doing the same output, simply because, be, because the big three can get away with that. You tried to get away from these arguments that American liberalism is the problem, but now we're getting to the issue again with neoliberalism not being able to understand what unions are. One of your best takes is how the media seems numb when it comes to covering labor movements. It's as if they've forgotten how to effectively report on them. Moreover, the same seems to be happening with CEOs and people in positions of power. They've lost their ability to respond to labor movements like they used to in the past. Yes, there is a really unique opportunity here for unions and unionization in general because of, uh, because of how, how much capital has won this this class war okay that ceos are too comfortable and are completely oblivious like to to how to effectively combat unionization uh and no that link doesn't work my friend if there's any way to bypass the the paywall i would love to get there for this bloomberg article i want to read it ceos today have never lived in a world with strong unions they don't even consider them a threat even in heavily unionized industries exactly that's precisely what it is they they're they're so comfy like they're so used to just like no movement no momentum whatsoever that they just like forgot what it's like when unions do strike uh, i was only giving you one side of the coin i was going to get to what you just highlighted and that is that you did uh, reach an agreement that was necessary which was a long time ago now even though it doesn't seem like that, that long ago of shared sacrifice and shared profits but I don't know if the agreement's been breached, but certainly the, the workers got the short end of the stick in, in recent years because their wage the increases didn't keep up with what nobody knew we were going to have inflation this high. Uh, but they've got, a, they've got a legitimate beef. So as you point out, um, th there's got to be a middle ground here. I don't know if it's 40%. If it's yeah. what, what, what is your solution? What, is, what would bring them into... What would make it fair, and I hate using the term fair because it's in the eye of the beholder, but what would make it fair to rectify uh, that, that they have, their wages have not kept up in the last two or three years? Yeah, that's, no, that's exactly it. I think that, sh that violation of that shared sacrifice, shared success wasn't intentional. It was because of the collective bargaining agreement. The last one was negotiated pre-pandemic, and no one anticipated the inflation we've been through. And so the question is, given what's happened and given the outlook over the next five years, which is what this agreement would be for, what's fair to address that? And if you look at just the compounding of inflation from you know, the last uh, 2019, when the last agreement began, through today, and then even if you assume a normalized inflation going forward, with I think, which I think is more likely than not, that ends up being 30% above where they are today uh, over that period of time. And so you can look at that as, I think, you know, fair. It allows workers to keep up with inflation. Um, it is, ends up being a significant increase. You know, the numbers we're talking about, whether it's the 18 to 20 percent currently being offered by the big three or the 40 plus percent has been asked for by the UAW, they are over five years and they do reflect a catch up period. So I think the way to address that is to have something more significant that's being offered today, uh, have a significant ratification bonus. Mainstream news don't even talk about the two tier system. They're just hammering the 40 percent, which they also like backdate. Okay. Uh, 
and and uh, act like that is how it's supposed to work when there are uh, there's a back and forth. This is negotiation. Okay, this is a, this is a bargaining process. You put forward what you think is the best solution, and then um, they go and say, "Hey, this is not feasible. This is our counter." Problem is. They're not doing fucking counters or they weren't doing reasonable counters. Their counters were completely unreasonable or not even out there to begin with. Oh. That's effectively a catch up payment for inflation and focus on that, which is great for workers, but doesn't hamstring the companies going forward. And to, to say a hard no to the things that basically repeat the lessons of the past, things like the job bank, things like 32 hour work week, things like retiree medical that bankrupt to the companies going into 2009 and which fundamentally don't help workers today and don't Green said it last time about not increasing car prices and they could get what they're asking for but what if they do increase car prices to subsidize the strike demand same with the writer strike if the streaming services all just increase their price like disney hulu did was the strike a success as in if stock buyback ceo pay remained the same while the consumer of the product seemingly picking up the tab that is completely outside of the hands of the labor union okay at that point, government intervention or government, yeah, government intervention of market forces is a necessity, okay? Especially when considering that all of this has already happened. Car prices have gone up 34% over the course of the past four years on average in the big three that is currently striking. The labor, the, the labor cost of each individual vehicle manufacturing has gone up by 4%, okay? So it's not tied to the labor uh, price. It's not tied to the union demands, as a matter of fact. This is something I bring up all the time, okay? Something I bring up all the fucking time, which is that uh, these, these prices are completely unmarried from uh, labor union demands, okay? Just completely devoid of that. If anything, the only market forces that they are considering in this situation is how much they can raise the prices completely unremoved from other uh, like stakeholders in the process and what their uh, situation looks like. It's that they are looking to the market and seeing how much can we raise the fucking prices without people being frustrated. That's it. And this is done in this day and age through... Um, this is done. Born, this is born out of crisis in times like uh, microchip shortages, for example, that creates a logistical hurdle, which causes uh, a short-term uh, rise in prices, and then that price maintains its stability. That price just stays up there because they realize in that time frame, oh shit, it don't even fucking matter. People will still buy it, right? So that's like one example of how inflation works. Another example of how inflation works or why it's such an ever-present uh, issue in American society, okay? Another issue on uh, American society uh, with respect to inflation is, is done through corporate consolidation. Corporate consolidation makes it incredibly easy to artificially inflate prices uh, and then have people think that it's happening due to uh, you know, some some major supply chain hurdles or something. Like, demand has stayed the same, and yet the supply is actually now uh, unreasonably low for one reason or the other. Look no further than the egg prices. Uh, if you want to understand that it has absolutely nothing to do with, like, the avian flu and the way that they try to hide it usually. Okay? It's just simply that most businesses obviously operate on their uh, uh, operate on their class position and what their class interests are. But beyond that, most businesses operate uh, as a unit, okay, in every sector. It's not a real back and forth, uh, constant sea of contention. There's a concept called price leadership, which is different than price fixing. Why is it different? Because price fixing happens in a cigar smoke filled you know, back room where monocle wearing CEOs get together and say, hey, you say, hey, we got to fix these prices. Price leadership, on the other hand, is done not in collaboration, but by one industry giant uh, moving in a specific direction to like, for example, in the airliner industry, uh, charging you for your bags. And then every single other airliner following suit. Price leadership 
works very well. It might as well be car, called price fixing because most industries in the United States of America are completely captured by corporate consolidation. They're oligopolies, okay? That's it. You don't need a conspiracy when everyone's interests align. Well, that too. But it certainly makes it much easier to conspire without actually fucking getting into a room and, and cutting a deal, which would be illegal and scary, okay? Um, you, you can do that when there's like three companies, okay? When there's three fucking companies in every sector, that's it. They can just like follow suit easily. Hassan, this is an honest question. Are you a hypocrite? Yes. Don't and then hurt the productivity and long-term success and viability of the automakers. Hey, Harry, has anybody called you and asked you to get involved? Because what you just laid out sounds like it makes an awful lot of sense. The idea that you think a 30% pay raise is fair because of what they've given up in the past and what they've lost because of inflation, but these other issues are the legacy issues that would drag the companies down. Has anybody called you from either side of the table on this? I've had, I've had a number of calls from folks uh, involved in one way or another, but I'm not involved in any capacity. I've got my hands full of my day job. Uh, but the uh, but I look, I think I've, I've done, I don't know how many dozens and dozens of labor negotiations over the years. And I think it's really important to think about things on a principled framework rather than just a quick bargaining. And what's happened here, Sean Fain has totally outsmarted the big three leadership, in my opinion. He has had a deliberate, thoughtful strategy. Um, he's done a great job uh, marshalling his rhetoric and support, even though it can't Oh, this is another aspect of uh, finance capital. Yes. Also, the over-financialization of everything means there's no desire for competition. If rich owners own stock and all the companies involved, why would they want anyone to win-lose? Better for them to all just equally take advantage of people together. Yes. That part as well is also very important. Win-win overall. We're all winning. Came through in a very narrow win in his elections a few months ago. Uh, he got out ahead of it. And the leadership of the big three really made a massive mistake by starting so small. They started off at 7 8% uh, over five years. That doesn't match inflation pre-pandemic, much less address for the issues. So that was inflammatory and I think, frankly, played into his hands a bit. Um, and can't blame him for that. He's trying to get the best deal for his people he can get. And so that's why we're here. If they had started off in a much more meaningful place in the first place, and establish those clear principles of you know something that addresses the problems workers have faced because of inflation but also they were literally talking about not having enough free cash flow to innovate like just keep making ford f-150s may i'll be good that's the funniest fucking aspect of this conversation it's like oh if we pay our fucking labor uh, adequately like what they deserve to be paid even when you compare it to like former contracts that we had um then we won't be able to innovate and it's like dog what the fuck are you talking about what's innovative about stock buybacks okay that's not innovative at all. Suck my dick. You didn't use that for innovation. You used that to artificially boost your fucking stock prices. And literally in the, in the situation where like CEO compensation is tied to stock performance, you just gave yourself a fucking pay raise. That's all you did. What's innovative? Suck my dick. Cash flow is, is almost always now used for stock buybacks. It's fucking ridiculous. And also... I don't even fucking fault these people for doing this, okay? Why should they have a conscience? Every single person thinks this is the right thing to do. There is no alternative. They're fucking rugged individualist capitalists. Why would they do that? Why would they not take advantage of a system that is designed for them to perfectly legally engage in artificial market manipulation, okay? Something that was illegal before Ronald Reagan. Why? Why would they not do that if this is what they're supposed to do? Okay, that's what's really frustrating about this, especially as it pertains to the the government's uh, role in this process. Do you think the callous disregard from the Biden admin and CEOs could lead to acts of desperation on the side of businesses? No, I think that the branded administration knows how to triangulate their messaging to, to come across as appealing to the labor force. And there are legitimately pro labor people in that administration that have been working very hard. It's just that. I hope that the brand administration will hear those people a little bit so that they don't come across like they're, you know, they got their pants down uh, and, and they're pissing against the fucking wind. Preserves long-term competitiveness. I don't think we'd be in this place. I don't know that we'd avoid a strike because I think there's still a big gap, but I don't think we'd be in this place. And I'm worried that both sides, you know, on the one hand, um, the, the leadership of the big three has to be realistic on these issues. And on the other hand, Mr. Fain can't overplay his hand because um, that could lead to a really bad problem for both sides. 
Anyway, also, it's not like they pay their research engineers very well. The highest paid engineer at 4GM is maybe 200k after working there for 15 years, which is chump change for them. Yeah. Um. Here's another Wall Street analyst that said the UAW I'm demands are reasonable know. because they are reasonable. Like that's the other part of this. It's like, of course they're reasonable. They're so they're so fucked in the way that they turned around and just did what capital owners are supposed to do in this situation, which is you fucking you 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 cave. You concede, you want the company to continue, uh, and you don't want it to be completely bankrupt. So you say, you know what? We're going to take away the COLA adjustments, okay? Like cost of living adjustments. We're going to take away COLA. It's fine, okay? And then, of course, they're never going to give it back. They're never going to give it back. You have to claw it back. That's what unions do. That's what capital owners do, and that's what unions do. This is how it always has existed. That's why there is a need for unions to begin with, okay? Anyway... But yeah, getting back to it, let's hear what this analyst is saying. Even Wall Street analysts can see that the giant car makers are not being reasonable and, and fair in their wage offers. A rep from Barclays expects lower rate wage proposals from the big three to climb higher, similar to other labor negotiations we've seen. I am yeah, I mean, this guy physically has to read the room, okay? His job depends on it. And if you read the room and you see demands and concessions being made to labor unions in every sector at a time when, like, it's not necessarily that the the labor marketplace is tight, okay? A tight, uh, a low unemployment and a uh, tight labor market is good and beneficial for uh, the the labor force in in negotiations. But like they have a lot of leverage at this point. You see, you see all of these companies making demands and and getting uh, their demands, you're of course going to assume that the big three has to operate in a similar fashion. I'm curious to know where you think the point of maximum pain would be, at least on wages. Would, would 40 over, over the term of the contract be crippling? We don't think it'll go that high. We think a more realistic scenario is that we end up at 25 to 30 percent. It's hard to say where this ultimately goes because there's ultimate there's various negotiation points. Uh, you know, what we've published in the past is that something in the 25 percent range would be similar to other labor negotiations that we've seen. And that's the basis for roughly uh, two billion dollars uh, of at least incremental cost that's being absorbed. But again, hard to say there, this is in the context of multiple negotiation points uh, in terms of inflation adjustments in in terms of product allocations, et cetera. But wages um, are, are, are likely to be higher than than what's being offered by the OEMs right now. At least uh, this is what we're assuming in our in our research. Yeah. This guy works for Barclays and can't afford nicer headphones. I mean, yeah, think about why. Um, why can't these CEOs see that this could be a massive PR boost for them? I mean, I, I think that it's, uh, it, the problem is the exact same thing that I just mentioned. It's like, why couldn't the CEO see this coming ahead of time? Because they're not paid to and they're silly. And they don't need to, or at least they didn't need to until now. And also, they don't care about PR. They care about profit, exactly. And uh, they care about short-term profit over long-term profit. PR boost versus ceding powers to workers. Kind of obvious why they're doing what they're doing. Yes, it is not in their class interest to concede to the demands of, uh, of, of uh, labor unions or labor in general. This is simply yet another expression of class war that they engage in on a regular basis. Obviously, it would be much better if this kind of class warfare was uh, being done uh, behind closed doors and quietly, but that is one, uh, that is one aspect of, of strikes uh, that you know, make this negotiations process way more public. And I am a firm believer that whenever things like this do happen, and nobody wants strikes, obviously, but I am a firm believer that when these things do end up happening, uh, it, it opens up a lot of people's eyes to the direct situation, like the direct realities that they exist under, okay? Um, maybe even they can internalize it and see it, uh, see it happening in their own workplaces. But one other aspect of this conversation that I must bring up, okay, is, of course, the way that the right wing uh, covers this kind of shit. Because I know that, like, I love talking about how the Democratic Party sucks and their feckless ineptitude 
and their negligent attitude against like uh, the Republican Party regularly trying to roll back progress has uh, caused death, demise, and destruction, okay? But there is still a major difference between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, okay? There is it's just at least like the Democratic Party is not openly antagonistic towards labor and the, the demands of labor. So here it is. Let's take a look at what, uh, you know, the moderate Republican, okay? The moderate Republican, Senator Tim Scott, uh, Mr. Uh, Virgin, had to say about the auto workers that are striking. A prayer partner of mine spent his entire career without a college degree working at Newcore Steel. And their pay structure took him over six figures for several years because he got paid for his work. The harder he worked, not only did he get luckier, but he got more money. Uh, and and that's, that's a recipe, it's a formula that we should be using all across the country, not just in South Carolina, but all across the nation. And we're watching today uh, on every screen around the country. Yeah, people are just not working harder, dude. It's like, uh, okay, that's really interesting. So how do they fucking get like $200, million, $200 billion in fucking accumulated profit? $20 billion in, the, in this year alone. How did that happen? If nobody was working hard, was it the fucking CEO's dog? Is that, is that who was working real hard? How did that happen? You know, it's like, dog, you're a fucking politician. Okay. You're the last guy. Like, this is the biggest says you moment to be like, oh, nobody wants to work anymore. It's like a Twitch streamer fucking literally chirping about how nobody wants to work anymore. It's like a CEO chirping about how nobody wants to work anymore. Okay. If there's one group of motherfuckers on, in, in America that work less than fucking Twitch streamers, it's this guy. You get $174,000 in taxpayer-funded government salary, you get platinum health care, and you literally don't work. You never work. As a matter of fact, as a Republican congressman, I'll take it one step further, your job requires you to not show up in many instances. Okay. Are you out of your fucking mind? He's like, these auto workers don't want to work anymore? Really? That's your commentary? That's the winning message? Even Trump has the wherewithal to understand, like, uh, to, to shift the conversation away, okay? Even, even Trump has the uh, understanding, the knowledge, the wherewithal the, the, to read the room and shift the conversation away to... Uh, I don't know, electric uh, uh, manufacturing, EV manufacturing is going to like ruin the industry or whatever the fuck. When, when faced with a direct question about the UAW's demands, even he knows you shouldn't be just like openly contentious to the fucking auto manufacturers, dude. Come on. It's like the one fucking sector of like American workers that still correspond to that old school American workforce mythos, Okay. Like, what are we talking about? Who, who, who's a worker in the country then? Fucking coal miners? That's it. 56,000 coal miners still exist in this fucking nation. They're the only workers. No one else. Like, what are we doing? Country, we're seeing the, the UAW uh, fight for more benefits and less hours working. More pay. Hmm. Uh. The UAW is, is pushing for more benefits and less hours working for more pay. Huh. That's real interesting. It almost feels like that's their fucking job, dumbass. Of course they would want to get paid more for less work. The fuck do you mean? Why? God, I hate Americans and how fucking stupid they are sometimes that they can't even comprehend what this guy is saying is so reasonable. Why wouldn't you want to fucking work less hours for more pay, you fucking idiot? Like, how stupid are you? How fucking cucked are you? How fucking cucked are we as Americans that we look to our direct class interests and go, I don't want that. That's not for me. Not for me, brother. You think the rich don't fucking think on their class interests and regularly implement their desires? Like at the top of the hour, the rich want you to see the three-minute ad break, which comes and goes, and it's three minutes long. But if you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe, which you can do for $5 or free with a Twitch Prime. Here's the three-minute ad break now. But yeah, how fucking stupid, how fucking stupid is this? 
stupid. He's like, oh, man, the unions want to work for less hours and more pay. Uh, okay. What's the other side of that bargain? What's the other side of that bargain? It's the bosses. The bosses want you to work the most hours that you can physically work with the least amount of pay they can get away with paying. That's it. There's only two sides of this bargain. That's it. It's that simple, okay? It's that simple. So if you only cover one side of this conversation and say these guys are so unreasonable with their demands, what you're doing in a very hidden way, in a very cowardly way, as a matter of fact, is defending the boss side. You want people to openly want to work against their class interests. You want them to work for long hours with the least amount of pay. That's what the bosses want, brother. That's what the bosses want. That's it. And fewer days on the job. It's, it's, it's a disconnect from work. And we have to find a way to encourage and inspire people to go back to work. Yeah, it's called better pay, jackass. It's called equity. It's called better pay. It's called autonomy. It quite literally is like giving workers their demands, like giving into their demands to be like, yeah, this is reasonable. Go ahead. You should have an ownership stake in the product that you're manufacturing. That's it. That's how, that's how it's supposed to work, which is hilarious because that's what the UAW is asking for, which is something that Tim knows and is currently shitting on. Very reasonable. And that's one of the things that, as your president, we would have. We would have a nationwide, sea to shining sea, focus on you pick the type of work, but if you're able-bodied, you're going to work. What's he going to do, bro? What's he going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to use the fucking National Guard to, like, make people work at gunpoint? Like, what do you mean? Anyway, it's just like, bro lost the neat vote, it's over. It's just, I, I wanted to point to that to show you, like, you know, it, there is still some subtle differences between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Uh, but, yeah, 